actually a forest forestry engineer and uh, well I was interested in uh, tree growth since the very beginning, since the very first year of my studies. I found it fascinating and uh, then of course I found fascinating what we can do with it and learn from it. So from the forestry engineering I started applying the neurochronology into uh, historic objects and uh, well I ended up doing my, a, a master in uh, cultural heritage and my PhD is actually based in the humanities. So. The first time I uh, showed this image at a Dendro conference, it was on a plenary session, uh, my keynote lecture, and uh, there were more than 200 people there, and there was this very loud wow, you know, because this is a tomographic uh, cross-section of that little sculpture that also Felix showed before. And what we can see here is the wood structure, basically. We are seeing the macrostructure, so vessels, we see the rays, we see the late wood perfectly, so we see perfectly all the tree ring boundaries. I mean, this is a dream come true for us, for dendrochronologists, especially dendroarchaeologists, right? So this is what we want to see on a computer tomography image. So, well, having reached this, the question is, are we there yet? And, uh, well, so today what I'm going to show you is some of the examples. This image, by the way, was produced here at the Flexray Lab. It's uh, uh, this wonderful collaboration that we've been having since uh, 2019. And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you some of the examples of the things that we've done here and, uh, and also at the Rex Museum. And, and yeah, and I'm going to put some questions uh, towards the end, uh, some challenging questions. So when I talk about wood in the cultural heritage, which is what I'm studying, I want you to think about all the type of uh, things that you can imagine that are made of wood, it's historic type of things, no? like uh, roof structures, uh, archaeological uh, sites, shipwrecks, either underwater or already in museum displays, uh, cabinets, furniture, tables, panel paintings, either on their own or as part of uh, um, uh, altarpieces, sculptures, of course, other type of sculptures, like the ones that you can find in, uh, in, in, in shipwrecks, and uh, yeah, in musical instruments, and so on. So what dendrochronologists do is, or dendroarchaeologists like myself, is uh, dating the wood, and find the provenance of the wood. And from there, we try to infer uh, further information like uh, timber trade, historic routes, and uh, well, uh, historic forest management practices, and how people in the past got the supply of wood to produce these type of things, and how they were working on it, so uh, tool traces in the wood, everything is interesting. But of course, we need to access the tree ring pattern in the wood, right? So here I'm showing you uh, a sample of oak and um, and yeah well, I mean when we have a sample like this we can just count the rings from bark to pith or pith to bark and then we know how old the tree was when it was cut to produce something but what we do dendrochronologists is measuring the ring pattern we measure those uh, ring widths to produce this type of pattern which is uh, pretty much unique for that tree growing at that site, right? And um, yeah, then what we do with this, when uh, we compare it with reference chronologies, and that way, in that way we find the calendar year, we find the date for each of the rings, and also the provenance of the wood. You now with chronologies providing um, higher or better matches, we consider, yeah, bluntly, that is the area where the wood came from. And then to produce these uh, um, reference chronologies, we sample lots of trees from the same area, the same species, and we, uh, we average them, so in, in short, and then we produce this type of reference chronologies, and then we expand them retrospectively, just going to historic buildings, for instance, that are made with wood from the same forest, same species, and so on and so forth, and that's how we extend our tree ring chronologies, reference chronologies back in time. So this is a bit about the, the basics of dendrochronology. And uh, yeah, as I was saying, we need to access the wood, and uh, the, the, we need to access the tree rings in the wood. 
And how do we do that? So, well, usually we have to employ invasive methods. So we can happily saw a piece of timber or we can core also in buildings, in shipwrecks, and uh, we obtain these type of samples. So cross sections uh, samples, which are, mind you, very handy, eh? because we can also do um, isotope analysis on this type of samples, which are also very interesting for us. But obviously, this is not something that we can go around doing. I mean, not because we don't want to, but they, we are not allowed to. And um, yeah, the, 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 the art world, especially, uh, has been demanding more and more the we do or employ non-invasive methods. Because, for instance, this is a panel painting and the classical way to access the tree ring pattern is to clean uh, a thin line here towards the underside, you see, there. So here you have a close-up. So as you can see, well, I always try to cut as little as possible and uh, yeah, to be the <laughs> least invasive as possible. But this is still an intervention that, I mean, this is a painting from the mid 17th century and now it's gonna have that intervention for the rest of its life. So yeah, this is a, a mark we don't wanna leave behind. In sculptures, for instance, the dendrochronological research is usually done on the underside. Here you see in this one, I had to clean also some sections. Sculptures usually have a very flat surface, so sometimes I just need to brush it and I don't have to, to cut. But in this case, for instance, I had to do it. And, well, and this is a case in which the sculpture is uh, broadest at the base, but very often sculptures have a smaller uh, underside and they are widest uh, at the elbows. So. For dendrochronology, we need the longest possible series because it will bring us closer to the felling of the tree. And yeah, we also have this type of sculptures, eh? like I showed you before. So this is a figurehead from a flute ship that was found in the Baltic uh, in 2010, I think. So they retrieved it. It was perfectly preserved. I mean, it, it still had some pigments in some parts. And as you can see, well, this, all, all my interventions, by the way, are in, 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 in agreement with the conservators and everything, so it's not like I go. Uh, but yeah, I had to clean it with razor blades, you see. And on top of that, I had to put chalk to enhance the visibility of the ring boundaries. Well, after, after this, uh, it went into conservation treatment with polyethylene glycol, and when it went out several years later, it was totally black. I mean, the whole sculpture was black, so my, my, what I did didn't matter anymore. It wasn't even visible. But yeah, this is highly impactful, and it's really undesirable, you know, if you wish. So, of course, the contribution of uh, well, imaging science I wrote, but uh, let's say computed tomography to dendrochronology is, of course, the non-invasive access to the tree ring patterns in, in the objects. And this, for us, opens a whole world of possibilities. <clears throat> so my first experience with computed tomography was, again, another of these figureheads. This one also from a Dutch ship that wrecked in Australia in uh, 1712. So the South Orb, and uh, this one is uh, currently at the Geraldton in Western Australia, and well, it's it's um, yeah, it's very well preserved, and it's fine, and they put it on this medical scanner, so then they sent me the analog uh, uh, sheets for me to do the dendro on those. Well. As you can see, well, can you see the rings? <laughs> I mean, when you look at this uh, image, intuitively, yeah, you, you see some rings, you know, but, but what we really need to see them all, and we cannot miss any, because then our series is broken, and then we don't get a date. So this is what you see when you look closer, or, 
well, we did also several scans of this to try and measure in different parts. So then I asked the archaeologists, well, can you send me some more at different heights? Because the rings were um, uh, eccentric, and then in different parts, I thought, I, the ones that I cannot see higher up, maybe I can see them lower down. But then she said, well, I have to pay, I don't know how many dollars for each of these images. And I was like, really? Can they just give you the digital image? Uh, do they have to give you the analog? So, well, that's the way it worked. This was 2009. And, uh, and I was flabbergasted. So I said, well, I'm sorry, but I really, the, yeah, there's nothing I can do with this. So on that same year, there was this paper very discreetly being uh, published in these proceedings. But it was a very, very interesting one. So it was already calling for the need of high resolution micro X-ray CT in dendrochronology and wood identification. And they published these fantastic images. This one from, uh, is this cross section here of this small uh, object. And this one also for, from the wood structure for wood ID. And then I thought, wow, I mean, we are going somewhere, you know, this is getting there. But of course, look at the size of this object. This is very small. So, okay, it was, it was a beginning. It was the beginning. And since then, there were several papers coming up in the past decade. And uh, yeah, with uh, Japan, for instance, uh, and uh, Austria, and our Belgian colleagues from Ghent leading the scene, so to say. And uh, very promising results, also looking at, how, at the structure of, of objects, internal structure and assembly uh, uh, types. And then the Netherlands came into the picture in 2019 here with the CVI. We finally were able to, to, yeah, to put the Netherlands in the computer tomography map for dendrochronology with this little sculpture that you've seen now several times, and it's also the image I showed you before. So this, uh, yeah, apparently insignificant object has a very interesting story behind, because it's, it was part of, a, of an altarpiece, and, um, but we don't know which one. And well, it was proposed in 2017 that it may belong to an altarpiece uh, made in Antwerp, but which is currently in Rennes in France, and, and well, could that be it? So uh, the curator from the Rijksmuseum, Fritz Holten, went with the sculpture to Rennes and they tried it in those places where they thought the sculpture could belong, such as here. But here you can see that she is actually quite smaller, much smaller than the other uh, figures. And then it was compared also with this one, which they could detach as well. And as you can see clearly, it didn't belong there. And uh, well, I also did the dendro in a conventional way. So on the underside, having to clean, of course, because I couldn't see the rings very well. And, and also, this is one of those cases in which the sculpture is wider, higher up. So at the level of the, of the base of the lantern. And I could match this pattern with this pattern, but still I had a very short series, uh, about 90, 90 rings or something, 92. And, but I sent them to my colleague uh, Pascal Fritter in Belgium, who had researched the sculptures from the Rennes altarpiece, and she said, well, it doesn't match them at all. I mean, and those ones are Belgium, uh, are um, Baltic oak, and this one is not, definitely. I mean, it would have dated also with 90 rings. So, we had the alternative of putting this one in the flex ray lab, in the flex ray machine. So then, uh, yeah, Francine Alexander back then was here as well, and Sophia Coban. They produced this beautiful image in which I could measure also several parts. And of course, they produce more images, so I measure the rings in different parts. And then you measure, measure, and average those measurements, and then you get a better, um, a, a more representative pattern of that part of the tree, so to say. And then we got a 102 uh, series long um, curve, which I could actually now match with a chronology from North, uh, North Western Germany and Eastern Netherlands is the Twente Westphalia chronology, we call it. 
And it's very, very interesting. This was fascinating because this area from uh, yeah, around Munster only supplied timber to the northern Netherlands. So we know that because I've worked in dendro archaeology in the Netherlands since 2007. So I've got plenty of data from archaeological sites, historic buildings in the northern Netherlands. And colleagues of mine, also from Belgium, we exchange a lot of data. And then I put the question out there, does anybody have wood from uh, Twente Westphalia in archaeology or in historic buildings in the southern Netherlands? And they didn't. So we know indeed that this area only supplied the northern Netherlands, which means that because that is the provenance of the wood of this sculpture, places the production of this sculpture also in the northern Netherlands. So this is something that the art historians have a, a bit of difficulty uh, uh, thinking about because they say, well, the style really is Antwerp style. And I say, yeah, okay, but what are the odds then that one piece of timber from this area ends up in Antwerp? Or that maybe an artist from Antwerp moves to a workshop in the Northern Netherlands and starts practicing with the skills he, was, uh, he had acquired before. You know, I mean, this has to come into the picture. Like art historians now, I mean, we have, we scientists have now a lot of data and we can do a lot of things to implement their knowledge. So they should definitely use it as well. And we should work together as we are doing, by the way. So this was a fantastic, fantastic result. And uh, this is another example of uh, what we've done here. And also a very interesting one, the Cadmus famous Cadmus painting, which had been dendrodated twice, uh, uh, given two different dates. So I was asked a third time, can you do uh, uh, analysis and see what date you come up with, you know, as if we were popping up dates, which is not, you know, I mean, if you miss a ring, if something goes wrong with your three ring series, you don't see the rings clearly, then, then probably you don't get a date or you go too far and give a wrong date, you know. So in this case, I said, well, I cannot do it actually because there is this frame, little frame around the painting. I'm gonna uh, close up here. So uh, yeah, there you go. There you see, there is this little frame. So I did not have access to the transverse section of the wood where I need to see the rings. Then I learned that the other dendrochronologists had measured the rings here, right on the back, but well, can you see the rings? Well, neither can I. Eh? I mean, I can see some, but if you miss one, then your series is wrong. And then far the problems come from there. So we decided to scan it here, you know, I mean, with this project going on, fantastic. And of course, the first question that came to mind is, how should we scan it? No, should we do it? Uh, should I mean, because for dendrochronology, we don't need a full 3D image of the object. We just need a cross-section. So ideally, it would have to be a cross-section somewhere where there is not much uh, metal in the paint to avoid distortions. And, and also, yeah, we thought, okay, like this, we use less tiles, but with the tiles will be going in and out of the uh, detector frame every time. Uh, therefore, we, we decided to go for this vertical tiling and having the painting placed like this. And uh, well, once again, uh, Francine uh, and Sophia, in this case, produced this beautiful image. And this is one of the tails from the, uh, well, one of the tiles, sorry, from the uh, outer part. And, and this, this was fascinating. I mean, when we saw this the first time, well, I mean, the question came uh, to mind right away. What we see here is the oak frame. Here is the painted surface. Eh? There you see the distortion uh, caused by some metal in the paint. And here we have the oak plank that we were seeing at the back. And we see also the, the tree ring. So this, is, this was very good to, to date it. But what we see there is a different type of wood. So actually, all of a sudden, the date of the oak plank at the back is totally irrelevant because the painting was actually painted in a different type of wood. 
in a different plank altogether. So what is this? So now we really, really needed to know what that was. And yeah, one of the limitations that we find here is it would be fantastic if the resolution could be good enough to be able to see this uh, wood, this wood species, to see the wood structure. Not, not only on the transverse section, but to be able also to slice it in the ta tangential and radial section, which is what we need to uh, identify the, the wood anatomy. Well, the, so this is the, the thickness. Uh, well, anyway, we wanted to know what that wood was, so actually a piece of that little frame was broken on one side. So Paul van Down removed it very carefully and we could take a micro sample there. And then we found that it was a uh, Suetenia species, which is a type of tropical species that um, yeah, is present in, in Europe or in the Netherlands, for instance, or via Spain since the 17th century. You know, it was used to, uh, as cargo, actually, as boxes. And uh, this could have been a secondary use. But we, there's nothing more we can say. I mean, then, of course, I could date the, um, the oak plank. Here you see the whole cross-section. And I could date it. It dates very well with the Baltic chronologies in uh, 1548, which is irrelevant. I mean, that is just an oak board that was trimmed to size and glued into the, the tropical one. For what reason? We also don't know. So, but that was something that we discovered thanks to the uh, computer tomography image. And um, yeah, lastly, well, this is the, the setup at the Rijksmuseum. So the great thing about this facility, here you see Paul van Down for, for the scale. He's almost two meter long. So it's a large, large uh, machine and, and it can also rotate and move uh, up and down and the platform is also quite big. But uh, yeah, you can see the type of, uh, well, this looks very much like a Cold War type of uh, console and setup uh, from some Russian lab. But uh, yeah, well, this is what, what we have there. And uh, yeah, now it's improving, of course, uh, bit by bit. They are improving different bits and pieces and hopefully this will turn into, into a, a large facility where we can do high resolution uh, computer tomography. And uh, yeah, of course, it, it's, uh, well, it, I had to showcase this one, the, the Hugo de Groot uh, chest. It was really great that it could be scanned there because indeed it led to this uh, next breakthrough, so to say, in computed tomography of large objects. Uh, well, not computed tomography, no, this, this is not a full rotation, but just through a line trajectory or scanning uh, this plank here, moving the object sideways, we could see the rings and, uh, and they could reconstruct them very well. So I could measure them also and match them with uh, uh, photos that I took digitally from the outside of the plank. And uh, well, this earned us, uh, us and all the team, of course, the, the Team Science Award, and which was really nice because he also put this type of research on the spotlight, you know, so there is some momentum that we should also profit from. And uh, well, going back to my initial question, so are we there yet? Let's wrap up a bit. So the size of the object is still a limitation for most facilities. I mean, the flex ray is fantastic here, but indeed, I mean, if I could, I would ask Sinterklaas to bring one 10 times bigger, you know, and <laughs> so that we can fit much larger objects and still work on improving the resolution. The resolution indeed is limited. So it's limited either by, by uh, uh, hardware, no, the, the, the detectors or the sources or indeed the, the size of the, of the object as well. So, but I mean, I guess that something can be done about it, right? I mean, you guys, I mean, technology is improving so fast that I can only imagine that, that this is only going to get better very quickly. The portability of CD uh, scanners. 
I mean, it would be great if we could just take the machine and, uh, and move it anywhere whenever we need it. But yeah, as you saw in the video, there's some walls had to be put down to fit it in here. So I don't think that it would be very appreciated if they would have to be taken out, apart from all the security or whatever. So, so this is something also to work on in the future. Eh? <coughs> And now the question that has been popping up, uh, I mean, every, every time I'm getting this question, in the past month I got it seven times or so. And so the long-term effects of X-rays in, in materials, especially in pigments and binding media, and so, as we were discussing during lunch. So I, I, I thought, well, I've been talking to the, about this with different type of people. So chemists on the one side who were uh, forwarding me to the physics and the... Uh, yeah, I think because this is a very interdisciplinary question with many factors at stake or, or interplaying, uh, then no one from their own side is, is capable of, of solving it, of course. So what we need to do is, I think, in the, yeah, maybe this is the place actually to bring different people, people with different expertises together and start brainstorming about this and start thinking about, okay, how can we answer this question, is there really this long-term uh, effect? I mean, all pieces are degrading nonetheless, you know, but okay, are we increasing the speed of that degradation or how is this affecting that? Because we really need to move towards these non-invasive techniques as a standard. So, but maybe, well, I guess this is the audience who likes to be challenged, no? So there you go. <laughs> so looking at this, uh, well, are we there yet? I think that we are just getting started and we have uh, very exciting times ahead. So thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? <laughs> Hello. Yeah. So you're a, a dendro expert. Uh, but I'm wondering about um, wood species identification. Mm -hmm. uh, are the catalogs with these species just as uh, accurate and uh, robust as the ones here? And what we would we need to do to do non-invasive uh, identification? Yeah, from, there are already groups working on uh, using uh, deep machine learning uh, to, for non-destructive or non-invasive wood identification or something that you can just uh, take a photo from a log in a, a tropical wood coming into the harbor and they take photos and they want to have the species. Yeah, I mean, we should go there. It would be really great. We need to see the, 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 the microscopic level. We need to reach um, um, a resolution that allows us to see microscopically into the wood. And at what resolution is that? Is that nano? Are we looking at the fibers? Are we looking at the fiber bundles? Is that what, uh, is that what the catalogs are all about? Yeah, yeah. We look at, at uh, yeah, 200, for instance, magnification. So we need to see, there. Yeah, for instance, with tropical species, there are many different things like, well, yeah. I. I it's, it's very, very complex, but yeah, we need to go, I think, well, with the micro CT, they are getting there already. It, the nano is also very good, but of course you need that sample, eh, usually, so. I know that Paul and Jan has a lot of samples that we can look at. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks for the, for the nice presentation. Um, I was wondering how you date uh, tropical wood, because then d d you don't have the grain lines, right? Or mm. No, with uh, uh, fully tropical species grow more or less continuously, or they also have variations depending on monsoons, for example. So then the problem is that those variations do not fall within a calendar year. And then they can be used for ecological purposes, but they cannot be used for dendrodating. We need species that produce rings within yeah. calendar years. Okay, yeah. 
And uh, another, if, I'm, if I may, mm -hmm. uh, I have some experience in scanning violins, and I had the same discussions on, on whether it is, would be harmful, etc. And then I um, had the discussion in terms of how much radiation, uh, for example, a musical interest, uh, instrument gets if there's a transatlantic light, the flight, for example. <laughs> yeah. And then they they change their their thoughts a bit because then yeah it's it's basically very much uh, related to each mm. other. Yeah, so um, we actually got the same or we use the same example of a transatlantic flight when a painting is uh, sent to another museum elsewhere. Didn't convince them. So. Oh, <laughs> no. ah, okay. Well, I did. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, are there any other imaging modalities that people use ex uh, except for X-ray CT? Um, because to I look through, you mean? Yeah, or? because I think on one of the papers I quickly saw like MRI flashing up or something. Yes, but that was a comparison they did. Yeah, well, ah. it's, uh, it's, it's rotating. If I put it, it will throw the animation again. Yeah. But the, in that one they were comparing. The, the quality of the image obtained with one or another me method. And, and computer tomography is still the best one, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, thanks for your presentation. I, I, just, I was just curious about one of these graphs that you show the age of the wood versus the thickness. Mm -hmm. And when you measure like a couple of samples and then the fluctuation in the beginning of the curve was like too much. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the last part, the thickness was almost the same. Is there any reason like how, how do you? Yeah, that, that's just uh, tree growth, typical tree growth. They grow fast in the beginning, just, just like humans. We grow very fast in the beginning of our lives, just like trees, and then they decrease uh, that trend. That's a natural trend growth. So, oh, uh, but I mean, like the differences between different samples, like in the in the beginning. If okay, you let's go there. Uh, wait, sorry, I could have gone. That way. Oh yeah, this is a long presentation, no? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's also fine. <laughs> this one or this one? Uh, this one. Uh, I don't know, like yeah. by my eyes, like the, the ones after 1980 or 1960, yeah. they are more overlapping compared to the ones in the 1860. Ah, that is because there is a higher replication. There are more samples there. That's why you perceive it like that. And here there are many less. Replication is lower here than, than here. Ah, okay. Okay, yeah. And also here, we are closer to the pith, you see, of the trees. This one starting mm -hmm. there, start there, starting here. And they, they have a less sensitive type of growth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah, a very, oh, quick. a very quick one then. Yeah, it's not so much related to CT, but you were talking about this altarpiece. Um, how likely is it that within one altarpiece, different types of wood? Do you ever encounter that? Multiple mm. pieces of wood in, in one altarpiece? Multiple provenances, you yeah. mean? Yeah, yeah that, that could happen, but uh, predominantly Antwerp was supplied by the Baltic at that time. Yeah. So we could also have different provenances within the Baltic area. But in general, that was the, the primary supply in the early 16th century. 